I'm going to ask you a question this morning as we get started and before we look at Scripture together. What is the hardest ending you have ever endured? You know, something really good came to an end. Anything, anything jumped to anyone's mind? Basketball career. Bas- baseball career. Okay, the athletes are speaking up. The basketball, that was one of the things that came to my mind. That last high school basketball game. Yeah, anybody else? My running career? Oh, working career. I was going to say, I'm glad when my running career came to an end. <laughs> working career, yeah. Anybody else? What's that? Hunting? Well, but you get to hunt again next year, so that really didn't come to an end, right? But you're, you're bummed when hunting season ends. Yeah, what did somebody else say? A good book? All right. Marriage? Pregnancy? Yeah. Yep. All right. Yeah, I was thinking, you know, when I, when I was thinking through that question, I thought, you know, some of us might say things like, like a sports career, things that are maybe a little less significant in the grand scheme of things, obviously. And then there might be some more serious things that might come to mind. Maybe some of you are thinking of something really serious right now and you didn't shout it out, which is fine. Uh, but, you know, those answers, whatever comes to your mind when I ask that question, what's the hardest ending you have ever endured? You know, it, it can really indicate some really tough seasons in our lives, right? But also, God's faithfulness and provision in the midst of that. Regardless of what that answer might be, regardless of what you might go on through your mind when you think of a really tough ending that you have to endure, God created us, if you think about it, to endure the endings of this life because of what's to come. And so how are you doing with that? When you think of things that are difficult to endure, How are you doing? You know, Paul was coming to a really difficult ending in his ministry as we're in Acts chapter 20 this morning and we we see Paul coming to the end of his third and final missionary journey, which means the reason that was difficult is because it meant the ending of some really important relationships for Paul. It, It meant the ending of things that he had really invested a lot of time and effort into for the sake of the gospel. And so let's see how he did as we begin in Acts chapter 20, verse 13, let's how he, see how he did in, in, in enduring these endings that he was having to face with some really good friendships that he had. So in verse 13, it says, Then we went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Assos, and from there, intending to take Paul on board. This is that section of Acts that began in chapter 16, where Luke is now, they're using second person plural because Luke is a part of this, he's, he's a part of the journey right now, right? So Luke is talking uh, as, as one of those traveling companions. For these were his instructions, since he himself was going by land. When he met us at Assos, we took him on board and came to Mytilene. Sailing from there, the next day we arrived at Chios. The following day, we crossed over the the, to Samos, and from the day after we came to Miletus. And so just, to, just if you have your Bible maps, it's easier to see, obviously, in the back if you have your Bible. But you can see, remember last week, he had went across the Aegean Sea, and then he went back to modern-day western Turkey. And now, and so the part that we're talking about is right through here right now. And so it says, we're going to see, he didn't want to, he, he was trying to get back to Jerusalem. He didn't want to go all the way back into the mainland of, of Asia, as it said, of, of Asia Minor, he didn't want to go back into Ephesus, so he, he's asking to meet them here before he continues on this journey. And a lot of what we see here, you guys had an opportunity in August to go to some of these places uh, if you go with us uh, on our trip in August to Turkey. But let's see then, as so we continue reading, it says that for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in the province of Asia because he was hurrying to be in Jerusalem, if possible, for the day of Pentecost. Now from Miletus, he sent to the Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. You know, it's interesting, even a church uh, that was likely much smaller than our church, they had multiple elders or pastors, uh, the healthy biblical model for the sake of equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. So we see that here as he calls for these elders of Ephesus. Now, why did he call for them? Well, it was because probably to encourage and to sharpen them. He called for them because of this relationship that they had, and he wanted to encourage them. And that, that's really, when we talk about this trip in August, that's what you will have the opportunity to, go, to do if you go in August to that same part of the world. You will be going with an opportunity to encourage and to sharpen our partners on the ground in that part of the world that are doing the work of the ministry 
and, and, and leading churches, just as we see Paul encouraging the elders of Ephesus right here. And so it says in verse 18, when they came to him, he said to them, you know from the first day I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility, with tears, and with the trials that came to me through the plots of the Jews, that I did not shrink back from proclaiming to you anything that was profitable for teaching uh, or from teaching it to you in public and from house to house. I testified to both Jews and Greeks about repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus. What a great summary statement of our mission as followers of Jesus and our mission as a church. Right, right there in verse 21. I love that, that verse because it summarizes what we're here to do. Verse 22, And now I am on my way to Jerusalem, bound in my spirit, not knowing what I will encounter there except that in town after town, the Holy Spirit testifies to me that chains and afflictions are waiting for me. But I count my life of no value to myself so that I may finish my course and the ministry I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. And now I know that none of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will ever see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of everyone's blood, for I did not shrink back from declaring to you the whole plan of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for the flock, all the flock, among whom the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God. I love how we have here, so he said elders in back in verse 17, and then he says overseers, and then he says shepherd. Those, those are three words that we use to refer to the same office. You have elder, you have overseer, and you have shepherd or pastor, uh, and you're using the verb sense here. And so all three of those, talking about the same thing, they're used interchangeably in the New Testament, and this is one passage we see all three used together. Pastor, shepherd, or pastor, overseer, uh, elder, all, all talking about the same thing, these, these men in Ephesus who are leading the church uh, to shepherd them. So he says, they shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And men from among yourselves will rise up with deviant doctrines to lure the disciples into following them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for three years, I did not stop warning each one of you with tears. And now I commit to you, to God, and to, to the message of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands have provided for my needs for those who were with me. In every way, I've shown you that by laboring like this, it is necessary to help the weak and to keep in mind the words of the Lord Jesus. For he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. After he said this, he knelt down and prayed with all of them. There was a great deal of weeping by everyone. And embracing Paul, they kissed him, grieving most of all over his statement that they would never see his face again. They escorted him to the ship. Father God, we pray this morning that we would have the type of relationships that we read about here in Acts chapter 20. And Father, that we would be able to invest in one another for the sake of the gospel, that you would give us wisdom this morning when we think about the focus of our purpose, that you would give us wisdom to think how can we rightly understand the truth of your word and apply it to our lives. And so we pray, God, that you would guide and direct us, open our minds and our hearts to rightly respond this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. So as followers of Jesus and as a church following Jesus together, we say that our passion is the gospel, our church is our family, our world is our mission. So that's our, that's our purpose. That's what we're here for as Christians and as a church. And so I want to talk today about the focus of our purpose. We must focus on the goal and, and our purpose at hand, which is what we'll be considering this morning. Nearing the end, as we see here for Paul, the end of this journey, Paul was determined to finish well keeping his eye on the goal of his faith and the mission, whatever our calling may be, because there's different things that we're called to in life, right? But whatever that calling might be, we too are called to be faithful to the end, right? Keeping our eyes on God, keeping our eyes on the people that we serve, that God has put in our lives, not our difficulties, not putting our eyes on the detractors and the distractions, but keeping our eyes on Christ and his people, and so if, if we're to be gospel-centered, if we're going to be family-oriented and based, if we're going to be mission-focused, then what should our focus be? I mean, what should our focus be if we want to have that gospel-family-mission mindset? How can we have the right 
focus when we think of those things. Only if we do, if we have that gospel family mission focus, only then can we live the life that we're called to live and, and really finish things well. And so my purpose this morning, my challenge for you as we look at this scripture that we just read, is that you will have the right priorities to finish well. Disciplines or, or disciples, when we think about being disciplined in the faith and being disciplined to do what we are called to do by God, we're called to run the race. Right? We're called to run the race, the race and the journey of following Jesus and helping others to follow Jesus. And so just ask yourself, how are you running that race? When it comes to being a disciple who makes disciples, how are you running that race? What are you prioritizing for the sake of that race? What needs to change in order for you to run better and to prioritize rightly? And so I want to think about this morning two necessary priorities for a Christ-centered focus. How can we fix our eyes on Jesus? How can we seek to honor him above all else? Our priorities are incredibly important. No one ever says, ah, it doesn't matter what your priorities are. We all know that priorities are important in life, and none more so than it, when it comes to running the race that God has for all of us. And so the first thing I want you to see here in verses 17 to 27 is that we have to prioritize gospel mission, a gospel-centered mission. The gospel being the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus for our salvation, and the mission being to bring that gospel to the nations. And so we have to prioritize that gospel mission. Why is our passion the gospel? Why is our world our mission? Because this is God's heart, and it's the resulting call in our lives. Gospel mission. Right? But this comes, this comes with suffering, as we see here. We mentioned a plot on Paul's life last week. We see another one here in Acts chapter 20. We see two just in the same chapter. And so this comes with suffering, and as a result, there's this call to endure as a proof of our faith being sincere. That endurance is necessary. Like Paul modeled so well, and like the Bible clearly declares, we are called to be faithful to the end to be faithful to that gospel mission that's before us. One of the ways that we do this is, is by prioritizing gospel mission, by saying, you know what, this is a priority in my everyday life. Not just on Sunday, but every day to prioritize gospel mission. Paul was trying to get back to Jerusalem, right? We see that, we read that here, we talked about that. He was trying to get back to Jerusalem, why? Where he could proclaim the gospel, continue to proclaim the gospel, continue to facilitate this gospel mission. And then we know that he wanted to get to Rome. Why? So that he continued to focus and prioritize the gospel mission so he could bring the gospel there. But notice all the things that Paul emphasized here in verses 18 to 23. I mean, we could have a whole sermon series just on these verses. If you look in your Bibles again at verses 18 to 23, we see consistency, we see service, we see humility, we see compassion, we see endurance and boldness and courage and gospel proclamation, repentance and faith. I mean, all of this just jumping out at us here that we see Paul modeling for us and prioritizing. What an example that we have for us right here in these verses. What a challenge for us. That are these things that we're prioritizing for the sake of gospel mission. Verse 21 tells us why the priority is gospel mission. So that people will repent and believe. Because there's no other way to be saved except for to turn away from our sins and believe on Jesus alone for salvation. And so we see that's why this priority is so important. And then in verse 24, he declares the focus of our purpose that we see, but I count my life of no value to myself that I may finish my course in the ministry I've received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. What if we all had this commitment what if we all had this resolve? What, what could it be for our church and for our community and for the nations if we would all say, you know, my life, it's not worth anything if I can't do it for the sake of the gospel. If it can't be for the sake of gospel mission, then it's worth nothing. Of course, this isn't possible unless your passion is the gospel. It's not possible without your church being your family. It's not possible without the world being our mission. This is how we can live with no regrets and be used of God for his glory and the good of others. I love what we see in verses 25 to 27 because Paul tells us how to live with no regrets. That's why Paul could say what he said in these verses. He proclaimed the gospel and he preached the whole plan of God's will according to God's word. And so he said, I, I, the blood is not on my hands. 
The only way to be innocent of the blood of others is to preach the gospel and the kingdom of God to them. That's the only way. So how much blood will you have on your hands because of not taking advantage of the opportunities that God puts before you to declare the truth of his word to those around you? Paul lived in his example in such a way that that others would be spurred on by the focus of our gospel family mission purpose. Just like the disciples, you guys read this morning about the disciples in Acts chapter 5, right? In family groups for those who were here. And, and you learned about from the gospel project, that remember the session in a sentence? I love the session in a sentence because I think it says so well and it really speaks well to what we see here in Acts chapter 20. That Jesus had instructed his disciples to preach about him a mission they strove to be faithful to even when their lives were in peril. So remember, Acts 5 was before Paul was a believer, but now Paul is doing the very thing that those disciples in Acts chapter 5 were doing. His life was in peril. It was dangerous for him to do what he was doing here, and yet he continued to do it faithfully. Serving Christ in gospel mission is worth the cost. And so what are you doing to prioritize gospel mission? Are you praying? You know, we talk about who's your one. Are you praying daily for the lost? Are you handing out the invitation cards? You know, these cards that we have all over the building. I mean, every room has these cards. And yet, sometimes I walk around and I see these these little card stacks that we have, and I see that they didn't look no different than they did last week. Nobody even took one of them. And then sometimes I see these things that are empty, and I'm like, praise God, somebody took a handful of these, and they're handing these things out. And I've met people that have said, yeah, I got invited by somebody at Walmart who gave me one of these cards and I decided to check it out. Praise God. But not just handing out the cards, are you asking God to give you opportunities to share your testimony and through that to proclaim the gospel? Kids and youth, I mean, think about are you being an example and a witness in your everyday life with classmates at school? with teammates that you play ball with, with friends, with family members who don't believe? Are you being a witness? Are you being an example? Or how about adults? How about with your coworkers, neighbors, friends, relatives? Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses. This is a promise that Jesus gave. It's not only a command, it's a promise. You're going to receive the Holy Spirit and then as a result of receiving the Spirit of Christ, you're going to be his witness. You're going to be a witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In other words, no matter where you go, no matter where God puts you, you're going to be a witness for him because you have his Holy Spirit when you believe. That's a declaration and that's a promise. Prioritize gospel mission. The second thing I want you to notice then is we've seen throughout the book of Acts, prioritize church family. Again, as we've seen over and over, this is Jesus' plan A. Plan A for whom he died and there is no plan B. There's no plan B besides the church. Paul called for the elders of the church. He went and he planted churches. Every Christian in the New Testament is plugged into a church. And so we must protect the church's people. And we must protect the church's doctrine. That's what Paul's focus was as he talked to these elders. The people and the beliefs. Prioritize church family. Who we are. How we endure. What we believe. We have to prioritize that. And that's every believer's responsibility. Not just mine. Not just the other pastors. But every believer's responsibility to do this. And so this is great instruction for pastors as we read Paul's instructions here. He's talking to these pastors. It's great instruction for pastors in the rest of this chapter, but it's also great advice for all of us as followers of Jesus because think about it. This is advice for what church life should look like here in Acts chapter 20. This is advice for how to prioritize church family. This is advice for what to look for in pastors Because nobody tells you this is your new pastor. You decide who your pastors are. You decide when we have lay pastors or staff pastors. It doesn't matter. The church decides that. And so it's important. How do we know what to look for? How do we know what to pray for? Well, here's some great instruction right here for that. Along with 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 when we see the character qualifications. But look at verse 28 again. This is what pastors are to do. Pastors are to guard their spiritual health, and they're to guard and protect the spiritual health of others, the people Jesus purchased with his own 
blood, shepherd members of the church. Another reminder, by the way, of why defined church membership is so important. Because who are we responsible to shepherd? And, and how can we keep up? We need to know that. And so that's why we value membership so highly here. And why it's so important for us to think through and not just think through membership flippantly, but realize the value of it and the importance of it. Not just for me, but for all of us as followers of Christ and as a church. And so, to be clear, as, as we see in verses 29 and 30, none of this is easy. Why? Because false teaching and deception. It's all over the place. We see churches destroyed because of this. So if this isn't prevented, that's, that's the result. That's what happens. Churches get destroyed because of false teaching and deception, making this incredibly important. Paul was a great example of this shepherding, as we see in verse 31. Pray for this. For Richland pastors, this would be a great, you want to know how can you pray for me right here? Therefore, be on alert, remembering that night and day for three years, I did not stop warning each one of you without tears. That, that we would have such a conviction and a passion and a desire to love our fellow members that we would not stop warning and pleading, please don't turn away from Jesus. Don't turn your back on the church. Don't think that there's other priorities that should take precedent over the priority of gospel mission and church family. That we will love one another enough to speak that truth, to hold each other accountable. This is what should be expected as, as, of pastors. When you think about who do you want to be your pastors, when you think about, I want to be a part of a church, how, what should the pastors be like? Right here, this is it. And so hold us accountable whenever we fall short. This is something that you should be able to expect. And you should say, you know what? If God has called you to be a pastor, you should, heart should break when people aren't where they should be in their walk with Christ. Don't settle for less. God's word is our foundation and, and we have to be centered. And look at verse 32. This has to be the center of our foundation right here is God's word. Never settle for a pastor who isn't grounded in God's word. Never settle for a pastor who doesn't teach God's word. The message of salvation and sanctification come from this right here. This is where it comes from. It's not, it's not us saying, you know what, I think I've figured out a way for you to be fulfilled in life, so let me give you some self-help advice. Let me tell you from my experience. No. Right here, this is, this is where the, the, the message of salvation and the message of sanctification, that lifelong process of us being made more and more like Jesus, getting closer and closer to the Lord, it's all right here. This is where it is. And so if we start teaching things that contradict this, then we're wrong. The message comes from this. Paul worked hard to make sure the gospel was central in his ministry and that the church was protected. And we see that in verses 33 and 34. We see him laboring for this aim that we need to prioritize church family, prioritize accountability, prioritize purity and, and biblical faithfulness. When we truly prioritize church as family, as we see in verse 35, then we're fulfilling who Jesus created us to be and we're doing what he has called us to do. We all know the blessing in this. I mean, think about it. It's, it's about what we can give for one another that, that's so much better than looking forward to what we can get. And we know that if you've done that, if you've given sacrificially, you know how much better that is than receiving. This, I mean, you think about this, you read verse 35, this is the Acts chapter 2, I put these on your ref, references on your notes, the Acts chapter 2 church, beginning in verse 42, the Acts chapter 4 church, at the end of the chapter of Acts chapter 4, the Acts chapter 11 church, I think beginning in verse 19, if I remember correctly, I mean, that, that's, that's the New Testament church right here in verse 35. Fitting that we read that this morning in Verse 35, and then we also took up the benevolence offering. It's more blessed to give than to receive, which, by the way, we, we put a bucket outside, or out, right outside the door here, also for the benevolence offering and our offering. And we don't expect, please be clear, we don't expect guests to give. This is a, an opportunity for us to be faithful as members when we give of our tithes and our offerings and we give things like a benevolence offering. But this is why right here. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's an act of obedience and worship when we give, but it's also, it's more blessed to give than to receive. We're blessed when we do this. Church is supposed to be family, and family loves and cares 
for one another. That's what we see when Paul finishes this section here, and, he, and he's having this time with these believers. Goodbyes, when we have a family in our church, goodbyes are difficult, especially the, the permanent in this life goodbyes. We talked earlier about those endings, right? Those endings, and we, we would all say the endings that are the hardest to endure are the permanent goodbyes, whether it's because of death or, or some other reason. Those are the hardest, but we all need the kind of church family priority in our lives that has these kind of relationships. It should be difficult to say goodbye. It's Jesus' plan and desire for us, though, to have these kind of relationships, to have this kind of priority where church is family. And with that, what comes with family? Sometimes it hurts. It's messy. It's overwhelming. It's difficult to take sacrifice. But there's, not, there's no plan B. This is it. This is Jesus' plan. This is what he called us to. And that's why when we read at the end of Acts chapter 20, that's why this was so difficult for Paul because of these relationships, because he had invested years with these believers ministering to them, equipping them, building them up. And, and so now the goodbyes are difficult. But do you have these kind of relationships with people in your church family? You're not going to have it with every single person because obviously we don't have the time and energy to, to have these kind of deep relationships with every single person. Even in a smaller church of, say, 50, 60 people, you can't. But in our church family, we should all have these kind of relationships. And if you don't, could it be because you don't have the right priorities? Pastor Tony Evans once talked about how there's a, a clever young, young guy named somebody else. And, and he, he, he told a little poem. I wanted to read it because I thought it was helpful. He said, there is nothing this guy can't do. He's busy from morning until late at night substituting for you. When someone asks you to do this or to do that, what is your reply? Get somebody else. He'll do it much better than I. So how much to do in this weary old world, but workers are few, somebody else, all weary and worn, he's still substituting for you. Isn't that so often true? When we think about, it's just easier to wait for somebody else to do it, isn't it? I'll just wait for somebody else. Well, somebody else, the ultimate somebody else, the one who is perfect, that somebody else, Jesus Christ, he died on the cross for our sins to make us right with God, but not only to make us right with God, but he also did that to enable us to serve him and to serve others. So when you know him, then you prioritize gospel mission. When you know him, you prioritize church family. You're not content to just let somebody else do all the work because you've been changed by the only somebody else who could do all the work. And so now he's changed you so that you can carry on. And as Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. We're called to carry on the work, to do the work of the ministry. You know, in, in Paul's advice to Timothy, similar pastoral advice we see in verses four, or cha 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. He says, pay close attention to your life and your teaching. Persevere in these things, for by this, doing this, you will save both yourself and and your hearers. So this is great advice for all of us ultimately. Yes, it was pastoral advice to Timothy, but this is great advice for all of us. And so think about that. You, through your words and your actions, through your life and your teaching, how are you doing? Remember I said my, my purpose today, my challenge for you is to have the right priorities to finish well, to finish the race that God has called us to, to finish it well. Examine your life and your priorities right now. What needs to change so that you're set up to finish well? I think so often we would do well to ask ourselves, would I regret it if I didn't do this? If I, if I was to look back at my life and I didn't do this, would I live with regret? And so many of the things we prioritize, there's absolutely no way we'd regret not doing those things. Nobody looks back in their life and says, man, I wish I would have watched that TV show. I missed it. Such a good show. No. No, instead they said, man, I wish I would have loved my church. Nobody ever says, man, I wish I would have went to more of those weekend events where I could be gone and miss my family 
No, they say, oh man, I really wish I would have taught my kids the priority of gospel family mission. Those are the things we live to regret. Even, I don't think anybody looks back and says, man, I wish I would have traveled more. They say, no, I wish I would have went on more mission trips. That's the kind of travel. You see, so often we, we think through things and we think, I'm going to prioritize this because it makes me happy. It's not just about what makes us happy. It's more blessed to give than to receive. That's what's ultimately going to fulfill you. Not looking for happiness in the world, but looking for what would honor Christ and would build up his church. Perhaps a better question rather than saying, examining our lives and saying, what needs to change? Maybe it'd be better to, say, to ask a couple people that know you well and say, you know what? Do you think my priorities honor Christ? What if we asked maybe our spouses, maybe our kids, maybe our closest friends, think about my priorities. Do you think that they honor Christ? Do they point others to him? Do they tell the world that gospel, family, mission are important to me? It all begins and continues with the right relationship with God because we know the reality is that God's plan alone, his design, his purpose is the only thing that's going to satisfy us. But because we all sin, we all sin and we fall short of God's perfect plan. And what does that lead to? That leads to brokenness. I mean, think about it. All those wrong priorities that we talk about, that we all know that we struggle with, there's a temptation to have the wrong priorities. Those are a result of brokenness. The priorities that would not help our walk with Jesus. Things that we prioritize ahead of Jesus and his church. That's because of our sin leading to brokenness. And most importantly, our sin causes a broken relationship with God, which means we all deserve to spend eternity in hell because our relationship with a perfect God is broken by our sin. And yet there's one thing and one thing only that can fix our brokenness. And that's the gospel. That Jesus died on the cross in our place for our sins. He died because of our brokenness. And on the third day, he rose from the dead. He won the victory over sin and death forever. And so now if you simply repent of your sins and you believe in Jesus alone for forgiveness and salvation, he will give you a new life. You see, turning from your sin and surrendering your life to Jesus, it's the only way to be saved from brokenness now and brokenness for eternity. Now we know we're all still broken, right? We're not there yet. We're not perfect. We're far from it. We're still broken. And yet we know that as Jesus changes your life, you begin to recover and to pursue the perfect plan and purpose that God has for your life because you're being changed. You're being changed by the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart. And so every day, more and more, you're saying, you know what? I'm not content with those priorities that don't help me pursue God's plan. I don't want those things anymore. I want to walk with Christ. And so as that change takes place in your heart for the rest of your life, those priorities, that focus, those commitments, those change. And that process of being made more like Jesus, is, it becomes evident in your schedule in your checkbook, do people have checkbooks anymore? Your, your, your bank accounts, yes, so the old people say yes. yes. <laughs> but, but it becomes obvious in all of those things, the things that we do, it, it points to the fact that, hey, my life is different than it was before. And so my priorities are different than they were before. My commitments are different than they were before. My focus is different than it was before because I've been changed by the blood of Christ. Following Jesus and helping others to follow Jesus. Father, that's our prayer this morning, that we would truly, with all of our hearts, follow you and help others to follow you. That we would not be content to settle for priorities that would not grow us closer to you, but that we would prioritize what does grow us and others closer to you. Father, we pray especially this morning for those who are here, maybe those who are watching online, those who haven't yet trusted in Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, please give them the desire to do that this morning. Give them the longing to call on your name. And Father, we ask that this time of response now would bring you glory and that you would help us to desire to have the right priorities. In the name of Jesus, amen. I'm going to ask if the praise team